everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is PVD Horror. My name is Dave. I'm joined here with my co-host, Brandon, and we have a special guest returning to the show today. We have writer, director, Ted Nicolau, who has been on previously, and you guys probably know him from a number of genre films over the years, such as our favorite, Terrorvision. Uh, but today we are here to talk about Subspecies and his newest installment to the franchise, Subspecies 5, Blood Rise. So, Ted, thank you for taking the time to talk to us, man. Hey, thanks, Brandon. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, Dave. shit. Okay, <laughs> let's start over again. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, good to see you guys. Thanks, Brandon. No, no problem. We look like twins. I get it. Don't worry yeah, exactly. about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you'll make that cut, right? Yeah, yeah. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> so, Ted, welcome back to the show. Last time you were on, we were given very little info on the next subspecies film. And then back in August of 2022, I was excited that you shared a selfie on your Instagram of yourself at the airport with a caption, <laughs> first step on the way to subspecies five. I remember sending it to Dave saying it's happening. What was going through your mind at that time? Uh, at that moment, uh, it was like 25 years of anticipation of making the movie yeah. and uh, kind of one false start when I went to Albania, thinking maybe we would uh, shoot there and scouted locations for Albania. And then uh, COVID kind of put the whammy on that. Uh, so that day I uh, got on the plane and was basically simultaneously terrified to be going to make the movie in a new country with a whole new crew that I'd never met except uh, by Zoom. And um, simultaneously excited to be soon joined by Annas and Denise and Kevin and uh, kind of my old cohorts in the subspecies movies. Nice. So yeah, like you said, last time we talked about Albania being like the location you wanted to, but had issues because of like production and Siberia's budget was a little high. Can you, fi can you fill us in on how the location um, was chosen for this film? Yeah, um, there's a guy named Justin Martell and his partner Seeger Dixon. They have a company called uh, Media Pioneers, I believe is the name of their company. And their uh, specialty is kind of putting film productions together with uh, foreign countries and uh, uh, production companies in foreign countries. And they were the ones who kind of connected us in Albania and uh, they were shooting Castle Freak, that kind of uh, remake of the Charlie yeah. Band movie. Uh, in Albania at the time. And so I went and scouted locations there, met Justin for the first time. And uh, when Albania kind of didn't work out uh, to be as as like production friendly as they thought it was going to be, they suggested Serbia and they were kind of partnered with a company called Red Productions in Belgrade. And so basically, they kind of approached Charles Band and said, we could put you together here in Serbia with Red Productions, and let's compare what money you have to spend in the film and see what they could do. And then began a very lengthy kind of back and forth of, you know, we have this much money. Well, you can have this much for that. No, we need this much. And yeah. well, OK, we can give you this if you give us that. And eventually, uh, they kind of, uh, you know, arrived at a budget figure that would work and that uh, I felt I could make the movie for because basically we had held out for those 25 years, partially because Onus and Denise and I wanted the budget to be high enough that that we could respect the uh, previous films in the series. Yeah. And uh, because Full Moon was going through financial difficulties for a number of those years, we kept putting it off and Charlie kind of understood, you know, where we were coming from. And he too didn't want to cheat the movie because it's one of his more uh, popular franchises. So basically when they were able to kind of meet at the right point in, for the budget, the, the, we pulled the trigger and, you know, started pre-production. Wow, yeah. awesome. And the, the location again, I mean, you guys do such a great job with making the location so integral to the film. Uh, and this one, it just falls right in line with the previous films. Like this, mm -hmm. another beautiful location uh, just really adds to, to the story and like the auth authenticity of the story, I think. It really feels authentic. So yeah, it helps the mood of the movie. And, you know, yeah. uh, there were challenges in Serbia because... 
uh, in the script, it called for, you know, the castle, the castle throne room, underground corridors, uh, and and then it also called for like 19th century kind of uh, Gothic architecture of a of a city like Paris or or Bucharest even, um, and looking around Serbia, basically the the castles were a little bit uh, squatter and more like fortresses. The the most amazing castles weren't really available to us for the budget and because they're also tourist attractions. Um, some of the really cool uh, ruined castles are like inaccessible on mountaintops and very, very impossible, you know, to get a film crew up to it. Yeah. So uh, somebody suggested to us, what about Southern Serbia, a town called Pirot that has a fortress? And so, so, you know, the two things I had to do when I first arrived was one, scout every possible location that we could find. And to uh, start casting because the cast will get to the cast in a minute, I guess. But the the yeah. cast was really important. So so uh, in the scouting, the we there were no castles with a traditional kind of throne room, one big hall where where a lot of the action was supposed to take place. But at the For Belgrade Fortress, which is kind of in the center of the city of Belgrade. There's like a lot of exterior walls and no giant towers or anything that sort of reminds you of kind of the castles that we shot at in in uh, Romania. Yeah, but they had but Belgrade Fortress was used like as a ammunition storage for uh, for wars that they were uh, fighting and, def and the fortress was there to defend Belgrade. And we found this underground place in the film which is now the throne room this kind of like looks like a uh like a kind of well-worn castle that like all the walls have kind of fallen mm -hmm. off of it um and and i thought well this could maybe work and and so we'll just shift it from a throne room of a castle to kind of the the subterranean parts of the castle kind of the older sections of the castle they had great uh corridors around the Roman well of the Belgrade fortress. And we found more corridors in a town called Niche at, a, at another kind of fortress. So so uh, the castles were a, a little bit of a challenge, but we we managed to make them work. The, uh, the throne, the uh, lair of Helena was another kind of difficult thing to find because in my mind, uh, like when we shot in, in Romania for uh, vampire journals, we could access the most amazing old mansions that are kind of part of the the city's yeah. heritage. Um, in in Belgrade, because our budget was much 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 lower, the locations were not so readily available to us. But we found a little kind of a wrecked old chateau, kind of a place out outside of Belgrade that ended up being uh, Helena's lair. And with the help of our direct, of our um, production designer, uh, uh, Ivan Chirovich, he kind of dressed it and made it look opulent. And opulence was not part of our budget, but <laughs> by carefully selecting little bits and pieces and the way they were lit, it, that ended up working for us. The other thing was like finding um, spectacular landscapes and and. Yeah. Uh, so we spent a lot of time kind of just wandering around in the southern part of the country and the mountains there and found some pretty some pretty great locations. And and for me, if I have the cast and I have great locations and a really good director of photography, which we should talk about in a minute, uh, the you know, that's kind of the essence of creating the mood of the movie. Yeah. What uh, the people I'm sorry, Brent, I just wanted to ask. So when you're like exploring these places like these foreign places that you're not familiar with um and you're looking to set up a film and have all these people there the, as part of part of the crew um do the people that are from there are they welcoming are they kind of like oh what are you guys doing here uh have you met with any like resistance to you guys kind of setting up camp ever no no i think uh people i mean in belgrade is like a just a very modern city and and there are uh you know limitations to filming and things cost more money uh but our production company like does commercials and does a lot of work around belgrade so they were able to 
cut us a great deal at the Belgrade Fortress. And then when we went down to Pirot, which is in the very southern or southeastern part of the country, um, they there it's like kind of small town world and people were very, very happy to have us and uh, things cost very little. Um, so really we did I didn't encounter any resistance. I think the only uh, kind of rules that we had to engage by were like when we wanted to shoot in the in the cave that became Cersei's uh, lair. That cave was full of bats and they didn't want us to put smoke in there and smoke okay. was a big part of our atmosphere. So, you know, just little ecological things like that that you have to be aware of. But no, we had a, it was uh, for me a, a great location shooting experience. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of locations, I noticed on your Instagram, you would take like pictures of like the hallways and some of the buildings. What was that like? <laughs> Ah, you know what? Because every night I was like, okay, where am I going to eat tonight? And kind of yeah. would wander around. My apartment was kind of like in the old quarter of town. And so it was near this old brewery that had been turned into a bunch of bars and restaurants and uh, the big main cobblestone street with all the Serbian restaurants. So I'd wander around and uh, see a door half open or something. And, and I'd kind of poke my head in just as, out of curiosity. And started seeing these hallways that just looked so kind of all of them were just so geometric and interesting to me that I just I took I took a photograph of one and then and I was like, wow, this this could be an interesting study is and just poke my head in everywhere I can and shoot what I can. So I ended up taking a lot of hallways of Serbia, the hallways of Belgrade photographs. Yeah. <laughs> And like you talk, you were talking about earlier about some of the cast and crew. You know, some franchises aren't lucky enough to bring back actors from the past films. It was great seeing Anders back as Radu. Also having Kevin and Denise back was awesome for fans. How much did it help you um, to like create this film with the new cast? Uh, you know, the for me, the subspecies movies are really are Anna Sove and Denise Duff and uh, Kevin Spiritas also. Um, so. Kevin, uh, Anas and Denise and I had sort of met up at a bunch of horror conventions over the years and were always talking about making this movie because the script was written like around the year 1999 or 2000 or something. Oh. And so we were all aware that there was this prequel waiting to be made. So they wanted to make it. To me, I couldn't make subspecies without Anas. You know, he's he is Radu. Um, and Denise is like the perfect kind of balancing person for honest uh for me i wanted in this film to kind of also help explain who ash the music lover from vampire journals is and how he came to be part of on radu's family um and and i wanted like a some new characters and some new blood in in the subspecies story for to help generate more kind of stories if we if we get to make another one mm -hmm. so uh you know, I, I wanted to cast some of those roles here in the States or in, in the UK, but the for budgetary reasons, the idea was, okay, go to Serbia, see what you can find, and, you know, if we can make it work, let's use local talent. And, and I like using local actors because the actors of Europe are, you know, so incredibly well-trained, mm -hmm. and I like the the music of different accents kind of within a, a movie, especially in the world of subspecies. It's kind of like this uh, phantasmagorical world anyway. Um, so uh, we had a casting a director named uh, Anna Ilich, who uh, just sat with me and kind of we went through a million photographs of, of Serbian actors and read well over a hundred people, maybe 200 people by the time it was over looking for uh people that a could could act in english without it seeming difficult for them uh b really good actors uh people that seemed kind of like timeless had a timeless quality so they could be people from the middle ages up until the present day um and we got incredibly lucky with with Stasha Nikolic, who ends up playing Ariel. She was like, came in 
probably two thirds of the way through the casting process. And when I saw her, I was just like, wow, this woman is really fun to look at. An incredible actress embodies kind of both, both sides of that character, the kind of innocent and then the, the, the depraved person that she does become. So uh, we were really lucky with her, really lucky with um, with uh, Petar Arsic, uh, who who plays uh, Radu's uh, monk and sidekick. Uh, that role I kind of had in mind um, uh, Jan Hajduk from uh, the subspecies films, who played yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Lieutenant Marine, but um, scheduling didn't work out to to bring him over. So uh, so we got really lucky with Petar and and uh, Anas really liked working with him a lot. Uh, uh, then we had Olivera Perunicic, who was like uh, the the dark kind of forceful vampire hunter. Um, she came in and she had lived in the United States for a few years and studied acting there. and her English was really impeccable, and she's got a great look, and and so we were lucky to get her. Um, then, oh my God, Yulia Grout, the Russian actress who's living in Belgrade, and she's like a, a like a total tour de force artist of uh, acting, movement, uh, uh, writing, singing, uh, painting and uh, kind of lives in a, in a little kind of artistic commune. And uh, she came in and, and there was kind of a competition for that character because we had some really, uh, some older actresses who were literally kind of crazy. And, and, and but Yulia came in and she was like, so, so completely in command of her performance and so good at kind of creating that character that, that we went with her. Then the final, uh, the final and most difficult role of all was uh, Stefan Radu's brother. Yeah. To find a kid actor in Belgrade who can speak English, and mm. not only just speak English but act in English, and it comes out as if that's the way it came out of their mind, was I was losing hope that we were ever going to find one. We saw so many kids, even opened it up to girls, thinking, well. Maybe we could get a girl who looks like a boy and maybe that'll work. And you no know, <laughs> girls at that age still look like girls, you know, it was proven to me. Um, and then right at the end, uh, right at the end, uh, Yakov showed up and he walked in the door. He was so self-confident. His English was impeccable. He had long hair, had that kind of uh, out of time look. And his mother was like, oh, yeah, sure. He can take the bus to production meetings, whatever. Like a 12-year-old kid, like traveling around Belgrade by himself, like you would not let your kids do in the United States. Yeah. And he uh, came in, Honest kind of took him under his wing, and, and he was phenomenal in that role. So, so we got super lucky, you know, finding a cast that really fit the the vibe of, of a subspecies yeah. movie for sure now the film premiered at 12 um at 24 alamo draft draft house locations for a one night only event were you able to go and check this, the film out on the big screen with fans <laughs> hell yeah man i like uh <laughs> i uh I was so excited to see the film on a big screen because you know like uh, over the last bazillion years since uh, the days of paramount and and full moon when we would finish a movie and screen it in the Paramount screening room for the execs at Paramount. I hadn't seen any of my movies on a big screen. And you mix for the small screen, you mix it in a small room, and you never get to see kind of the, the broad scope of the actual sound in a big theater and the the look of your film kind of projected larger than life. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was it was a wonderful experience for me. We screened it first at the Horror Hound Convention in Cincinnati, okay. um, but the the screen was not that great and the sound was not that great. So so it was like great to see it with three hundred people in the audience and and yeah. feel the excitement of that. But to see it on the Alamo Draft House screen was really really a kick. 
Uh, that's cool. So now the film will be streaming on the Full Moon Feature streaming service and Screenbox on June 2nd. So just for all our listeners, if you don't have Full Moon Features streaming service, what are you waiting for? I love that you have your own section right under the new releases to make it easy for fans to kind of like see all your work and all your films. How is it how is it being able to look back from when Full Moon started years ago to now that you guys have your own streaming service? How's that feel for you? You know, Charlie Band was always kind of at the head of the curve. He was the one who kind of saw the future of home video in the days of VHS. And maybe one of the very first companies to actually release films direct to video. And then he was, you know, when when VHS kind of fell apart and, and DVDs took over, he jumped on that. Then there was a period between DVD and Blu-ray when streaming services were kind of taking over the world. And he was a little slower to kind of get his streaming service going because I think it's a, a bit more of a challenge you know logistical challenge but you know it's cool that he's got all of his movies in one place and if i want to see even some of the kids movies i directed i can find them there um you know and i'll say to your fans if you don't have uh if you're not uh, signed on with full moon you could get a one week free subscription and uh check out all the movies that you want to check out yeah. Screenbox, I think, uh, probably has the same thing. And and I guess I'm going to sign up for Screenbox and see what it looks like there, yeah. too. And I think at the same time or shortly thereafter, it will be streaming. You could find it on Amazon, too. Okay. okay. I think uh, both Full Moon and Screenbox are definitely uh, very much worth the, the purchase, you know, for this film and just for uh, everything else they have to offer. Those are two great services right now, so. Yeah, and I think Screenbox is is for a month at least or so. They're gonna they're gonna screen. They're gonna have all of the subspecies films. So if you want to do a full on marathon and include uh, number five in it, yeah. you'll be able to do that. Awesome, uh, Ted. You uh, told us something a little bit before we started recording, and I don't know if it's alright for you to uh, announce this, but there's a little extra add on if you watch it on full moon. Correct. Yeah, yeah. If you watch the film on Full Moon streaming site, um, Charlie Band and I did a little introduction where we talk about the film and it's kind of entertaining to see us kind of just batting back and forth ideas. And yeah. um, so that that would be just special for for people on his service. Awesome. Okay. All right. So subspecies five, we start to get the backstory or the early story of our favorite vampire, Radu. And um so for anyone who hasn't maybe caught up to all the sequels yet, are there parts of the sequels that you feel uh, people should be aware of or anything that's important in order to kind of uh, watch this story? I mean, I, I know that like with, with consuming it's a prequel, you, can, you would assume you can kind of go in without knowing too much about it, but is there anything you feel like would be missing if someone hasn't seen like, let's see part three or four or anything like that? No, I think you could watch, you could start with Subspecies 5 and uh, go in cold and it the movie makes sense. Maybe it'll move a little faster than you would want it to move because we're introducing characters that people presumably know about. But I yeah. think you could watch it and and you would you would have your footing down. If you were aware of like Subspecies number two, uh, Bloodstone, and vampire journals, kind of the the spinoff um, uh, of subspecies. You, if you knew those movies, I think the process of watching subspecies five would be a little bit richer because you're seeing characters that you know from the present day, uh, their origins too. But I think the the origin stories work either way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, I mean, there's been a, a very long gap, obviously, which we've kind of acknowledged between the last film to this film. And I know you had said like this, the script was already kind of there and you guys had, you know, been kind of talking about like, oh, we should we should do this as you met up with them at the conventions. Now, do you feel like you missed the franchise? Like what motivated you really to be like, all right, let's do this now and did you feel like this was a story like that you wanted, you really wanted to tell? Was that kind of your reason for getting back into this at this point? 
It's a story that I felt was really strong uh, when I wrote it. it. It was maybe more ambitious and had more characters and more stuff going on. And we had to, over the years, kind of trim it down to make it possible to actually shoot. It was a story I wanted to tell and never had a chance to tell. It was a, an adventure with some really good friends that uh, I missed a lot, you know, yeah. like uh, I love working with Honest and I love working with Denise. And it's uh, somehow uh, I, I knew that there was like a lot of people out here out in the world who love the series and would be really happy to see another one happening. So so, yeah, it's like a combination of the the joy of making a movie with people that you love. Uh, the joy of making a movie that you that's already written that you know is has something a good story to tell uh and boredom you know like i, I like to work and yeah. um mm -hmm. I, there was a number of years where there weren't any films to direct and i was doing little short documentaries and things like that for the disney company and uh and after a while i was like you know what i'm tired of telling the stories of other filmmakers and their movies i want to get back to to yeah. what i feel like i do best and that's making movies too yeah now, last time you were on the show, you you told us that you had like a little diary that you kept it to kind of keep yourself entertained. Did you have another diary for this film or no? Or was it just- No, picture? man. You know what? The <laughs> I kept that diary on the first subspecies because the yeah. I was aware that it was like a, a completely unique and crazy experience. I wish I had kept it on number two because it was also a unique experience, but- there comes a point where, uh, you know, your evenings are just so full. Uh, fr you finish shooting, you have dinner, you have a drink, you talk to people, and then go back to your room. Do you really want to sit there and write for 20 minutes complaining about all the shit that went down that day? No, I don't think so. Uh, and on on this film in Serbia, it was sort of the same thing. Basically, our work days uh, in pre-production were kind of like every day there was something to do and every day whatever we had to do would kind of bleed into the night so then even at night we'd go to a bar and sit and have a meeting and talk about things so so by the end of that bar experience you know you don't you just want to go back home and go to bed yeah. and our schedule when we were shooting was basically uh split days so we would we would um, have a call time of like 12 or one o'clock and then shoot until midnight or so. And that that allowed us to have hours of daylight to shoot and then hours of night. And and um, Seeger Dixon, who was our kind of American producer over there, kind of really helped to work out a schedule that we were able to kind of make our days and actually take advantage of every bit of daylight, every kind of magic hour, and then every bit of nighttime that we could shoot too. I mean, every day was like a a real challenge to try to finish, but uh, but we managed to do it. Yeah. So one of the things that I think makes subspecies so appealing is like that most most of the characters, even like the evil characters, embody some good and some bad. It's like, um, you know, I think this film is in particular really explores that with our characters. You know, someone who is supposed to be like our our main villain, like Radu. We in this one, we're kind of intro introduced to like a, a a good side of him. You know, yeah. and then on the on the uh, flip, we have uh, at the beginning a female character who it looks very innocent, and you know, you would think would be all good, but then she leads to temptation and evil. Uh, is this dichotomy of of good and evil something that interests you and you intentionally want to explore or do, is this just part of the story that you wanted to tell and just kind of like is something in everybody that like we should all just kind of acknowledge you know i don't know how much of what comes out of my brain is accidental and how much of it is really thought out i'm not an analytical person and a lot of what comes out is just uh one idea fits to another and it all kind of yeah. comes out into this into this long piece i did want to show how radu could go from kind of a noble character to an evil character 
to the to the you know the depraved character that we know and love and in the in when i sat down with the actors for the first time my pitch to them was basically this is a story about family about radu seeking a family for himself to kind of to to alleviate the loneliness of like this endless existence and the fact that his family was so fucked up that he doesn't really have the tools to create a family with love um and and i found that to be a really useful to kind of keep the movie on track throughout and the actors kind of seized onto that and really understood it um and i liked the idea of Ash and Ariel, also innocence, but um, ambitious. And their ambition is kind of the hook that yep. that Radu uses to kind of pull them into his world. So, so I think it's a combination of, okay, here's the orchestration of characters in my mind and and how, do, how does each of their stories play out? And I think over, over the years, I've come to understand kind of the importance of um, emotion in uh, in a story and, and especially in movies i think emotion is kind of the key thing that that you want to uh, impart emotions to the audience you want emotions mm -hmm. on the screen and, and emotions in the music and so so I, you know everything came together on this movie you know beyond my own contribution my i'm there to kind of help everybody stay on track and inspire the various crafts people and artists and actors um but my contribution is only as strong as the strengths that i can bring out in everybody else and their own inherent strengths and and i think in this movie we were really lucky that everybody brought something to it and everybody kind of jumped yeah. on board the train and um and and added to the film so everybody plussed it in a million different ways yeah. you you might be one of the most humble people in filmmaking too like you always you did this I'm, I'm last totally time aware. too <laughs> <laughs> you did this last time too you give up which i think is great because it's it's absolutely true like it's a you know it takes a full casting crew in order to put together something special but you're you're really good at kind of shifting the you know that credit to everybody who's around yeah. you so i, I think it's important that. because uh you know, I mean, I'm I have an ego, but I try to keep it like <laughs> under control, man. Uh, and and I and I do believe that everybody, you know, I'm just there to as part of the crew, really, you know, and I'm there to I, I have to be in command and I have to know exactly what we're going to do all day long and what we're going to do next, 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 every minute of the day. But. You know, I want everybody to feel like they're free to contribute as much as they can contribute to you know i mean we i got uh, let's talk for a minute about the director of photography uh uh vladimir Ilich. he uh was a guy i guess he's done you know tv movies commercials and he's very very strong uh director of photography and for me the part of the challenge is always to come into a foreign country where nobody knows me nobody gives a shit who i am and try to win them over to the vision of this movie that I'm hoping that we're going to make together. And uh, Vlad was, uh, we sort of were a little kind of trying to figure out how to get warm with each other for the first uh, few days. And then we went on a location scouting trip and and got a little bit more friendly. And, uh, and you know, I tried to tell him some of my favorite films. He tried to tell me some of his favorite films. I showed him vampire journals and he thought it was too beautiful looking. And, and mm. I was like, what the fuck, man? That's like one of the best looking movies that I've gotten to make. But but OK, you just kind of give and take and share and have a drink and, and talk things over. Uh, then we got on the set and the first day we're in the in the corridors the underground corridors and he said okay so what uh how do you want to light this and, and i was like well you know the way uh my old director of photography uh uh, uh like the italian um jesus okay you, you'll cut this out right uh yeah uh, <laughs> um uh 
fuck, my brain is just gone. Anyway, uh, I, I, the way like an Italian would would light the thing would be, you know, some magical light at the end of the corridor, backlight, little little hazy light. And and Vla was like, no, 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 there has to be a light source. We need a light source. Um, what if we light it with, they'll carry a torch with them everywhere. I was like, okay, all right, let's do that. Well, you know, that if that makes you happy, let's do that. And so, so I kind of gave on that, on the lighting thing, uh, which led to a whole look of the movie, which is primarily firelight and yeah. uh, the, the gaffer uh, basically had, had a box that he had built, which is like a bunch of, um, um, incandescent light bulbs on flashing at different uh, times and speeds mm -hmm. uh, with a orange gel over it that creates the illusion of firelight. And it was so effective. And even with the torches, you know, like a lot of those corridor scenes are lit with one torch and that's the only light in the whole scene. And um, we had a, you know, the torch master, the guy who brought the torches, lit the torches, put them out. Uh, we had a budget for torches and the budget was not that high. And so we said, okay, we'll need a torch this day, this day, this day, this day. And then we get on the set and go, ah, crap, we need a torch today, but we don't have it in the budget. What are we going to do? So we'd have to go beg the torch master to, to come and bring a torch, go to his car, get a damn torch, bring some fuel and light the torch, please, please, please. And uh, he gave me a lot of grief, but he always would do it, you know. Uh, so, so uh, as as uh, days went on, and and Vlad said, "Let's. Uh, what if we handhold the camera all the time?" And I'm I'm used to a more kind of gliding camera, but I could see the benefit of handheld camera, like for time, for sh shooting fast, and also for giving the film a more kind of immediate sense of reality, and yeah. so. Our collaboration, basically, I come in and say, okay, let's put the camera right here and the action is here. We block it out. And then sometimes he'd go, no, what if we flip it and shoot it from the other side of the axis? Because then there's more background over here. And it would take me a minute to kind of rearrange the images in my head to kind of do that. But he he kind of kept me very honest. I kept him really honest. And we, we ended up having a really great uh, working relationship. That's awesome. Yeah, so I just want to say, you know, just after watching this film, the wait has definitely been like worth it for 25 years because I think I was uh, 12 years old the last time the last <laughs> film came out in 98. Oh, man. So, yeah, so being a fan of this franchise, like, like we talked about last time, from day one, I was just a big fan of it. And I just want to say congratulations on making this film you know and i've seen a lot of reviews from a lot of people that have been able to see it nothing but good things the same way you know wait 25 years for it so if everybody's listening and you're a big fan of this i'm sure you're gonna love it so definitely check it out when it releases yeah i'm so happy that people are digging the movie as much as they are you know i'm like mm -hmm. uh to to read the good reviews and to see people say such great things about honest and about the director of photography and about the movie in general i mean i feel like we we did not want to disappoint the people that love the series and that was yeah. the biggest thing in our mind was okay this you know i know people think subspecies four was like a big kind of let let down after uh, one two and three i think four has a lot of interesting qualities going for it but yeah we didn't have the budget we didn't have the schedule and yeah. and it and we were kind of limited in the locations and maybe the story is kind of takes you off the track of the kind of gothic subspecies story but for me i think it it, it works but i was aware and, and i did not want uh, subspecies five to suffer the same fate sure. can we talk for a second about the uh production designer yeah yeah definitely um, Okay, in the same way that you have to kind of get everybody on board, the director of photography, you kind of find a way to to inspire each other. Um, we had a, a production designer that uh, Seeger Dixon and Justin Martell had uh, worked with before, and they loved him. And they said, you're going to love him. He's great. He's fantastic. Uh, and his name is uh, Ivan Chirovich. And he works as a 
interior decorator and uh, designs like the Christmas decorations for the city of Belgrade, you know, every year and, and does like events and stuff like that. And so he's a kind of a big designer in Belgrade and he does movies just because he likes to have a little fun every once in a while. Huh. And cool. um, I had put together like a lookbook for the movie, which kind of showed costumes and locations and, um, and the way I kind of imagined it, it was super ambitious and, you know, like pulled everything from images from uh, Game of Thrones and everything I could steal on the internet just to kind of get the idea across. This is what I like the movie to look like. And he saw that and uh, originally Ash and Ariel, the traveling troubadours, traveled by a little gypsy wagon with, uh, and it was sort of inspired by the seventh seal, the actor's wagon and the seventh seal, the Ingmar Bergman film. And, and inside was real decorative and ornate and the outside was wooden and beautiful and had a cross on the door. And so I had some images of that and, and other locations and he saw those and he was like, yes, Oh, oh I'd love to do this movie. I want to do this wagon. So, so, uh, so we scouted locations. He was most interested in, you know, the throne room, the dungeon where uh, where uh, we first discover um, Helena, and um, Helena's lair at the end of the movie. Those were the the places that that were most interesting to him as a designer, and this wagon. Um, but when he kind of put together the budget, the producers just went, "What are you crazy? We can't do all. We can't do all of this." So the one thing that kind of fell off of the whole movie was we could save four thousand dollars if we just cut the wagon and ash and ariel don't stay in a wagon they sleep in the the kind of wine cellar of this uh, of this barkeeper that they're playing at and it's made him so sad but he understood and he he continued uh but so that that was like he was like uh kind of a mad crazy genius and you know i think he's you know makes a lot of money in belgrade but his phone has a cracked screen he barely answers it it's like old <laughs> shitty iphone and never answers the phone i could never find him we, he was always late to meetings he could keep you waiting from the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night for a meeting um and i was like what the fuck is with this guy is he not serious <laughs> and but he was out looking for props, looking for weapons, trying to make deals, cutting deals, buying uh, set decoration. And, you know, I guess you can't do that just in the center of Belgrade. You have to go out to the outskirts and all of that. So he was never around and always like, oh, don't worry, I'll show you this tomorrow and show you the weapons tomorrow and never got around to showing me anything. We'd finally meet up in a bar like at 10 o'clock at night and and I loved him. He was funny and really intelligent and really cool to talk to and really wanted to do the movie and do its best. But I was like, what the fuck is wrong with him? He's just, this is so disrespectful. But he would walk onto a set with his crew and just take bits of junk and cool objects and one or two really beautiful pieces and some old paintings and some shiny old vases and stuff and place them in such a way that a set that looked like nothing and a cart full of shit that looked like a bunch of stuff that was left over after your garage sale. Uh, and it would be put in such a way. And then once it was lit, it looked like so much richer than our budget was. Uh, so so I, I ended up loving him, you know, and and just enjoying the moments when he'd be on the set because he was like this little ball of energy kind of putting objects and complaining to his crew no 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 you have to put more <laughs> stuff here and more stuff there and and he knew exactly what he was doing such an underestimated um asset to a, a film right it like uh, nobody gives credit to the person who you know does the scene like decorates the scenes and kind of gives you that feeling of like what it is that you're supposed to what time you're supposed to be in or where you're supposed to be in yeah i mean i mean it, it, indeed the production designer is right up there in the creative contribution to the movie yeah but people don't talk about production designers like they do directors of photography or yeah. you know anything yeah. um yeah oh and editors people don't talk about editors very much either in this movie uh 
we shot it. And uh, usually uh, my son is a film editor too. And, and he, yep. I would have had him edit the movie, but he's in a band and the band was on tour at the time. Oh, and man. I was like, oh shit, who's going to edit this movie? Well, guess I could edit it, you know, because the the money in the budget to pay an editor, I couldn't hire like a legitimate editor, any of my contemporaries who are professionals because they would laugh, laugh me right away. Uh, the budget would barely pay for the assistant it would take to sync the dailies, you know, yeah. but I was like, well, what the hell? I'm not doing anything right now. I'll, I'll edit it. So I ended up cutting the movie myself too. Yeah. And uh, thankfully so, because you know, you you shoot a movie on a, such a short schedule, low budget, and there are a lot of things that don't quite work out, like fingernails breaking off. The fingers look like crap one day. The fangs are too big, and we have to recreate the fangs over a number of shooting days. And so there's all these little flaws that you have to find a way to to hide and disguise and cut around so that when people are watching the film, they are not aware of all of the difficulties you had making the film. Yeah. So it's from what I gather, it sounds like this is hopefully not the last time we see a subspecies film. You know, I think it depends now on if Charlie makes back his investment, you know, and okay. that's, you know, let's sure. see if the audience loves it and all the fans keep after him to, to make another one. Honest and Denise and I are like more than happy to. Is the story already written? No, is it story's already not, written and laying around? no, it's not written, but it's kind of rolling around in my uh, head, you know? Okay. Now and I think thinking. we sort of written ourselves into some corners now because sure. we'd like, there are little times where we could slip in in the 19th century like and, and show something and you know there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stories to be told and yeah. and um now that we've got some more characters that we can kind of depend on yeah i think we could tell some great stories okay i can't wait for that so me too whenever, man whenever you last time you like we said last time you were here it brought good luck because the film started rolling so hopefully <laughs> okay same way you know so maybe yeah. august we'll get another uh selfie saying it's time again so <laughs> okay yeah you guys are the good luck charm so spread yeah. the word man <laughs> and, and for everyone listening like i you know obviously check out the subspecies movies but also dig into you know ted's full yeah filmography because uh ted i'm probably this might be the first time you've ever heard this i actually mm -hmm. referenced ragdoll recently um and it wasn't like in a film discussion. We were, I was having a conversation about hoodoo, and I realized that Ragdoll was such a good representation of hoodoo. And oh, that's cool. So I was like, you guys should check out this film. And, <laughs> and so I just wanted to let you know that. But like, Don't Let Her In was a recent one you had done a couple of years back. Uh, we enjoyed that one. And, you know, there's a ton more that people can check out on Full Moon. So hopefully they do. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. And, and check out um, Dragon World and some of the kids' movies, yeah. too, yep. you know. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. that's good that you that you mentioned uh, Ragdoll because I hadn't seen that in a while. And I was like, hey, I better kind of look at that again, because that was like an unusually low budget film, very short schedule, but with a cast of all young black actors that were fucking amazing, man. Yeah. Amazing. And James Black playing that kind of little Richard, like badass yeah. gangster. Yeah. I mean, it's like freaking amazing. Was a, that movie was, there was something to that movie that was very <laughs> endearing. And I, I really did enjoy that one. So, you know, uh, hopefully people will check that out. Cool. Uh, I hope so. Ted, remind everyone when uh, Subspecies will be out on Full Moon and Screenbox. Okay. So Subspecies number five, Blood Rise, will start streaming on June 2nd. Uh, on Screenbox, the horror film service Screenbox, and on Charles Band's Full Moon Features uh, streaming service that's part of Amazon. And I believe you could also check it out on Amazon. But, you know, if you get a subscription to the Full Moon service, even for a month or two months, but of course you should keep it for the rest of your life, uh, <laughs> you can check out the movie and a bunch of movies all for just a tiny bit more than the price you'd pay just to see the the one film on Amazon. Yes. But absolutely. in any way you can, you should see the movie. Absolutely.
Ted, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for keeping your word and returning. And yeah. it's kind of see it, cool to see it full circle. Um, so this, I was, I'm just really grateful that you were able to join us again. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, no problem. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Check out Subspecies 5 on June 2nd on the streaming apps that were mentioned. And we will see you later. Have a good night. Take care. Take it easy.